Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Alrighty guys, we are at number 12 in our Mission Marple reread out of 14 books total that we're going to read, so damn near the end. And that is Nemesis by Dame Agatha Christie. Uh, like I said, the 12th book in our Marple reread. It is the 11th novel and it is, in terms of the actual chronology of the series, the last book, I think that if I were doing this over again, I probably would have moved the last book that was published up further to when it was chronologically written um, and made this the last book we read because this in terms of like the overall Marple arc definitely is the last book. Uh, so, you know, I hadn't read Sleeping Murder until recently, so I didn't know that. If I had to do it again, that's probably what we would have done. But anyway, all that to say, Nemesis was the last Marble book written by Agatha Christie, and you can tell, we'll get into it. Uh, but anyway, before we fully dive into all those details, I do want to let you know that if you have never seen a Mission Marple video before, what I am doing is rereading all of the Marple canon in order of publication. And sometimes I'm rereading, sometimes I'm reading for the first time, this was a reread. And what I will do is give you a book review where the first half is intended to to be uh, essentially non-spoilers and entice you to read the book and not give too much away so that you couldn't enjoy it if you hadn't read it before. So what I will do is give you a plot synopsis that goes up roundabouts to where we find a body, a little different in this one, we'll, we'll talk about it, which will include uh, some character discussion and character details. In the midst of that, we will then talk about kind of my impressions of the book, how I felt about it, where I ranked it, etc. And some of the overall themes, I tend to read these books with sort of a social history lens. So talking about how they reflect social attitudes at the time, pop culture, etc. So we'll do all of that. And again, the intention of that is that if you've not read it before, you could listen to that. And uh, hopefully it wouldn't diminish your enjoyment of reading the book for the first time. Then I will let you know, hey, it's spoiler time. And at that point, I will put that up on the screen somewhere, spoilers. And at that point, I will feel free to spoil anything in the Christie canon. Uh, yeah, whatever I want, balls to the wall. So that is what we're going to do today. And so let's go ahead and jump into the plot synopsis for Nemesis. Nemesis was written in 1971, but from the book, we are told that it has only been roughly 18 months since the events of a Caribbean mystery, which took place in 1964. Therefore, I'm going to place this book roughly in 1966 which would put Jane Marple at a smooth 99 years old. Yes, she is still kicking. She is still chugging along, um, albeit much slower now. Uh, there's a lot of references in this book of her needing kind of help getting around. But considering what she's doing in this book, I don't know any 99 year old who could be doing what she's doing. Let's just set that to the side. So Jane Marple uh, is at home and she notices in the paper that Mr. Raphael, who we met in A Caribbean Mystery, has passed away. Now, if you'll remember, Mr. Raphael in that book uh, was sort of her like co-conspirator. They like were adorable. I kind of shipped them together, um, but he had passed away. And in that book, it says very blatantly that he is kind of on death's door. So this is not too much of a surprise. What is more of a surprise, however, is that she sh soon thereafter receives notice from his solicitors that uh, there's something in the will for her. So she she goes over there and, and kind of goes over what the terms are. And basically, he has left her 20,000 pounds if she can solve a mystery. Now there is no description as to what that mystery is. So she's trying to even figure out what mystery it is she's trying to solve. But soon she also gets uh, a kind of notice that he has paid for her to go on, I think it's like a three week tour of England to see all these like kind of older homes and gardens. And she kind of presumes that this will be where she gets the details about what, what this mystery is she needs to solve. So she gets going on this tour. She's got her fellow travelers. There's a few like suspicious people on the strip basically um, that we quickly meet and uh, get various backstories for including a school teacher a couple of like randos who seem to like be watching Miss Marple real closely um, but eventually they're they're kind of like stationed out of a place called Jocelyn St. Mary not to be confused with St. Mary Meads which is her her hometown um, but Jocelyn St. Mary and in Jocelyn St. Mary she is approached by uh, a trio of sisters who uh, knew Mr. Raphael and um, who he asked to host Miss Marple while she was there so she kind of gets she's in the middle of all this setup and that takes a while um, and so I don't really want to get into too many more plot details because I feel like we'd be talking about the entire book suffice it to say she does figure out what this mystery is and she sets out to solve it she has a lot of um, people that Mr. Raphael is sort of like placed 
to help her along the way. So she gets her clues. She starts kind of uncovering something from the past that maybe people wanted to stay buried. And uh, ultimately, you know, we, it's a Miss Marple book, so we have some justice. And, uh, you know, Savage Marple, the body count definitely starts to add up. So I think that's all I'll say for plot synopsis. And I think I've given you most of the characters that I would be referring to in any of this thematic stuff. So uh, I think at this point, we can just transition into my initial impressions. So Nemesis is a book that I have very mixed feelings about. When I first read it, I gave it three stars. And when I first reread it, I also gave it a week three stars. But the longer it sat with me, the more I realized just how deficient it is in some ways. So I, I don't know if I've done this on Goodreads yet. I probably need to. I think I would ultimately give it a two and a half star. It is, I think, probably unquestionably, yeah, unquestionably it's the weakest of the Marple canon. This is not surprising though, because in 19, it was written in 1971. And by this point, Agatha Christie is like in her eighties. It is well known that her writing really took a dive in the mid sixties and never fully recovered. Um, some, some people really like Endless Night. It's not my personal favorite, but I can at least see the argument that that's one of the good ones kind of after that point. But in general, from the sixties onwards, her good books are few and far between. It's much more not great. And the book that this reminds me a lot of is Elephants Can Remember, not in terms of really the plot details, though we I, I guess I could make some parallels to that. Maybe I'll talk about that in the spoiler section. More just in terms of like, this is a really cool idea that is just not well executed because she's just at a point in her life where her writing is super repetitious and just filled with old people who all they do is sit around and talk about the past. And like, it's not... It doesn't have a lot of forward momentum. I think some of the motivations and explanations for why people do what they do is just not great. And I think that its overall kind of vision of psychology is really lacking in this book. Overall, there's just some problems with it as a, on a writing level, like on a technical level. There's also some problematic things in this book, which we will talk about in the spoiler section. So. You would hear that and think like, oh, you must have really... The thing is, on a page-to-page -page basis, I actually didn't have a bad time reading this, which I also felt when I read Elephants Can Remember, of like, objectively, I know this isn't very good, but I'm not having... I had a better time reading this one than I did Elephants Can Remember. I think this one is a little bit better. And there are a few interesting twists and turns that I think if she had written this book earlier in her life, this could have been a pretty darn good book. It just isn't well enough executed is what it boils down to. So for that reason, I am putting it at the very bottom of our ranking. So of the 12 books I have read so far, it is the worst, I think. I have now read all of the novels, so I can de safely tell you that I do think it is the worst novel. And as I mentioned at the beginning, now that I have read Sleeping Murder, which was written in 1946, but was published in 1976, now that I've read Sleeping Murder, I would suggest somebody who's reading through the Marple canon read these in order that they were written and not the order they were published. So it should be read as a book from the 40s, Sleeping Murder, and not as the last book. Because this does, I think, work pretty well as the final Marple book. Like, I think if this was the last book you read from Miss Marple, you would kind of have a sense of like, how her life was gonna wrap up. Like you kind of just, you have a sense of where she's landing. Basically, I think that this should just be the last book when you're rereading. And I do think in the sense of it being an ending, it works, it works pretty well. Like this felt like an ending to me. So uh, those are some of my impressions. Now let's get into, I think I can talk about a couple of themes, but really most of what I have to say is pretty darn spoilery. Okay, so one of the themes that I wanna talk about, um, I've already filmed once and I'm refilming now because I got real worked up and um, I'm just going to leave it at this, which is, I think that this book talks about sexual assault and sexual predation in a way that is really, really difficult to modern sensibilities. I think that it probably was pretty historically accurate in the sense of an older woman ref in this 1960s slash 70s reflecting on sexual mores. Um, I think that this is a book of its time basically in its attitudes, but it is so, so 
repulsive to a modern reader's sensibilities. I also think that this, though this is really helpful in kind of discussing some of the generational divides that we are currently experiencing when it comes to how we talk about victims of sexual assault and um, sort of the narrative around uh, when people re report the fact that they have been assaulted in some way. Um, so I'm just gonna read you these two quotes. Both of these are like one of these, the first one is from a psychologist and the second one is from a lawyer. And this is what they have to say about sexual assault. Uh, girls, you must remember, are far more ready to be raped nowadays than they used to be. Their mothers insist very often that they should call it rape. Okay, that's the first one from the psychologist. The second one's from the lawyer, and he says, well, we know what rape is nowadays. Mum tells the girl she's got to accuse the young man of rape, even if the young man hasn't had much chance. Would the girl add him all the time to come at the house while mum's away at work or dad's gone on holiday? Doesn't stop badgering him until she's forced him to sleep with her. Then, as I say, mum tells the girl to call it rape. So that is horrifying. And again, I don't know that it's not historically accurate. It's just very difficult to read where the authorial voice is clearly on board with those sentiments. Something that I think unfortunately lingers in older generations and kind of how they think about or talk about sexual assault today. I'm just gonna leave that there because I don't want to include a full on rant in this video. We'll just, we'll just leave that there and move on. A couple of other themes that are not spoilery, so I can talk about here is one that this is definitely one of her books that kind of, I think is reflecting um, the social interest at the time and the idea of sex crimes um, and sort of like sex maniacs. We see this in several different books in the late 60s and 70s where the, a sort of a, an emerging idea of criminality and sexuality was emerging. So I think that's interesting to sort of reflect on how she, she talks about some of that. And then I do think that we have the good old emergence of sort of like bad blood or like blood will tell uh, coming up in this book in terms of like how Christy sort of envisions evilness or characteristics being very genetically based as opposed to being environmentally based. Yeah, she is definitely somebody who is sort of like, I don't, I don't mean this in the most like polarizing sense of the term, though it can be used that way, but she's somebody who very much is kind of somebody who believes in eugenics to a certain degree in terms of like, our genetics, genes is destiny, like biology is destiny is, is something that I think is a, a real recurring theme in the um, Christy canon, though I must say much more so in the Poirot canon I've found than in the Marple one. So this is, I think, a rarer case where that definitely comes into the mix. So yeah, I think that those are most of my non-spoilery thoughts. So let's dive into some spoilery thoughts, shall we? First of all, let's just get the other big problematic piece of this out of the way now that we, we dove into some of the sexual assault stuff. The other big problem with this is that this is the age old trope of gay people being villainized or their sexuality being used as the basis of like them being murderous. <laughs> so I should say that it's not like, it doesn't come out and say that Clotilde it was in love with Verity. Like it's not, it, I kind of was trying to look this up to make sure that I wasn't just totally off base. Like reasonable reading of this book says that Clotilde fell in love with Verity. She became obsessed with her in a sexual way. And that when Verity fell in love and was trying to marry Michael Raphael, that sent her over the edge. She couldn't deal with it and she killed her. This is a very typical trope in media, in Hollywood, in books, where gay people um, essentially are like, go crazy and kill people they love. Uh, so in that sense, th that's something that's been happening in media for a long time. Agatha Christie is not unique in this, but I think to a modern sensibility, the entire motive behind the ultimate killing uh, is pretty dicey. Like it doesn't sit great. Um, I guess in some, like, here's the thing, cause the counter sort of counter argument to this is like, well, like, you know, anybody could go crazy and kill their lover. So like, why are you excluding gay people from being able to do that? It's the problem is, is that in representation overall of the LGBTQIA plus community is that the representation has been overwhelmingly negative. And when it comes to like a murder mystery, overwhelmingly their representation includes them being either a victim or a murderer. Like they're never just there. Like they're pretty much always suspect in some way. And often it is involved, like often there's this implication that somehow their sexuality has like driven them crazy and that's why they're a killer. So like that doesn't age well. I think that there's enough ambiguity in the text that one could read this as just like an unhealthy kind of like motherly obsession. So like, I'm not saying it has to be that, but I think that the more straightforward reading is that there is 
of romantic interest there. Um, either way, this definitely continues my theme that I have seen in these books, which is like female rage. <laughs> so um, in this case, we have an example, I would argue, of essentially like lesbian female rage and uh, that being expressed murderously. So I think another interesting piece of this is sort of the disposability of a certain type of girl. So I think Nora, like her death not having the same amount of weight put behind it or interest in it as Verity's did and essentially Clotilde knowing that and playing on it. Um, I think you're in the text, you are meant to see that as something morally repugnant. And uh, I definitely felt that. So I think Christy did a good job of sort of communicating the unfairness of that or the sort of grossness of that. The, though that being said, I don't know that I love in totality how Nora is portrayed, but we'll just let that go and focus on the positive. Overall, I do think this book reminds me a lot of Elephants Can Remember in the sense of both of them are focused on a past crime that then has like current implications. Both of them are filled with old people remembering things like and therefore it being very slow and repetitious. So it's interesting that the two last books that were written for Poirot and Marple are so similar in a lot of the, in a lot of ways in a lot of their structure or makeup. I think it's interesting that both of them uh, are dealing with a lot of the same themes and the same types of conflicts and characters. But I would say that I think that Nemesis is a, a much more successful version of this than Elephants Can Remember. I really do think Nemesis is a is a pretty noticeably better book than Elephants Can Remember. I'm not sure if that one year difference between them of Nemesis being written one year earlier made such a difference in terms of her kind of cognition or writing ability. It's possible at that point in her life it could have. Um, I'm not sure, but I do think that Nemesis is a better version of this type of story. And um, while I clearly had some problems with it, I, I wasn't mad while I was reading it. I actually quite enjoyed it while I was reading it. I really liked, I think the premise is really cool, which again, it shares with Elephants Can Remember that it's a really cool idea. I don't know that it's executed as strongly as it could be. Um, and in general, not a favorite Marple. Like I said, I put it at the bottom, but I think now that I've read all the novels, I can safely tell you, I totally understand why in general Marple people, some people really prefer Marple to Poirot because I think what I'm finding at this point is that I think the highs of Poirot are higher than Marple, but I think Marple is much more consistent as a whole. Um, so yeah, anyway, those are sort of my preliminary findings of, of rereading the series and we'll, we'll definitely get more into that later on once we get through a few more books. But um, yeah, I think that concludes my spoilery thoughts for this book. Okay, so that will do it for Nemesis. Guys, one more novel, one more short story collection and we will be done. Uh, I have already read Sleeping Murder and I will just go ahead and tell you that I really loved it. Um, so I'm very excited to talk to you guys about that. I'm glad that I'm not ending sort of the novels of this on a down note that we get to talk about something I really, really enjoy. And uh, I am looking forward to doing that with you in two weeks time. So let me know below what you thought of this book if you've read it. If you would like to have a full spoilery discussion, you can definitely go join us over in the forums on Goodreads. I'll have the link below for the folks who are taking part in this read along. Um, definitely feel free to go leave your thoughts over there as well. And I think that will do it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social medias if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below as well. And I think that will do it. I'll just talk to you guys soon. Bye.